Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Before we get started, I want to ask you something. Are you looking for a community of professionals that are looking to share, learn, and grow where you can talk openly and freely about the highs and lows in your business? If so, I want to invite you to check out my inner circle at AngelaProfit.com slash membership. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Profit, and thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Weddings Unveiled. Today, I'm super, super excited. This this is going to be really different and really fun because we're going to talk about all about finding your window, breaking into the wedding industry, which is probably the number one question I get from people who say, I want to pick your brain. Let's have coffee. I want to break in. How do you do that? And it's like, it just ain't that easy over coffee. But today I have Erin Shirley here. She's the owner of Memory Lane Events. Hi, Erin. How are you? Hey, I'm great, Angela. Thank you so much for having me on today. This is such an honor. Oh, I'm super excited to hear all about your story. Tell our listeners, we were chatting a little bit before, and so I feel like I got like the inside scoop, but tell our listeners a little bit about your background first before we like jump into the whole window part. Yes. So my background is a very long and windy road. I'm only 25 years old, but I've had a lot of experience in different industries. And I actually started out kind of being interested in weddings when I was a very little girl. I was very active in my church growing up and we would always plan showers and, you know, fun little bridal showers or baby showers for all of our members at our church that we're expecting. And it was so much fun to kind of work with the older ladies and help them and do all the setups and decor and all that fun stuff for that. And so that's kind of what piqued my interest. Um, And I went to school originally for fashion marketing. I changed my major four times and finally landed at Belmont, which was a different school in a different city than I started. Wait, in Nashville? Yes. So that's actually how I got into Nashville. I had lived in Kentucky growing up all my life in a really small town called Glasgow, Kentucky. And I I have lived. (laughs) It's very small. I always tell people if you blink, you're going to miss it. So it's it's pretty small. And we have a Walmart and a movie theater. So that's kind of the two staples there that we have in our little small town. But it was so much fun because that was kind of the thing that made me entertained was doing events and doing weddings and taking, you know, a high school gymnasium and turning it into something beautiful was kind of what really piqued my passion for events. And then kind of going to college and not knowing what I wanted to do, but I knew I loved interior design. So that was kind of my first major. And then I went to fashion marketing and then I came to Nashville and I landed on public relations and marketing. And so even though I graduated with those degrees, I still was kind of like, you know, this is fun, but what can I do to incorporate all four of my loves and all four of my passions in one? So I actually started an internship when I was in college, and that's what led me to events. And so my very first internship was with a company called Studio Wed. I worked with them as an intern, and I got to see one of my first events was just an empty building, and it kind of looked like an old warehouse when I got there and the planner was so excited and she was like you know this is gonna be beautiful when we're done and I looked around and I said this is gonna be beautiful when we're done I don't know about this but after you know hours and hours and hundreds of people coming in and putting up chandeliers and floral and draping and lighting it turned out to be one of the absolute most beautiful weddings I've ever seen and so that's what really got me started and 
I was like, wow, this is all four of my passions in one thing. And so I was really fortunate to kind of stumble upon doing events and doing weddings with that. So were you there when Mary Alice was there? Yes, that was who I interned under. So do you know our history? I do not know your history. Oh my God. Okay. So total tangent. Mary Alice interned with me years ago. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she started her company and she's actually one of the few people that interned and they were still like, okay, I'm, I'm down. Like, this is good. Like, I still want to start my own business. Far few in between does that ever happen. Yes. And then she, I think she did it maybe for about a year. And then I'll never forget, we went to lunch, I think at like, oh, Charlie's in Mount Juliet or something. Mm -hmm. And she's like, so I was approached by this company called Studio Wed out of, I think they started maybe like out of Atlanta or something. And she's like, here's the business model. And what do you think? And I'm like, well, I think that if that can work for you and your model, then it could be great. I said, I can never do that because my client avatar was more geared towards literally every single thing being custom. So with Studio Wed, I felt like it was, you know, you gave clients a few options, but it was like the options of the people that, you know, were a part of that community. It was a good concept for the right client. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know. I mean, that was so long ago because I think she had a baby mm -hmm. and then I still see her pop on every once in a while, yes. but I don't even know. Are they still open? I know that they're under new management, I believe. Okay. And I think that she's still, she started her own company, A Delightful Day Events. Yeah. And I think she's still doing that. Um, okay. I haven't seen her in a few years, but she's kind of who gave me my big break in the industry. And That's awesome. Yeah, she was so much fun to work with. And we were just very kindred spirits from the beginning. And so she really entrusted me that semester with one of my very first tasks. I remember I was so nervous was Aww. she wanted me to carry the bride's dress, the train of the dress down the aisle. And right before we got her to the very front of the aisle where she was going to walk down, I was going to step away and kind of fluff the dress out. And I had never even touched a bridal gown before. I didn't, you know, know what I was doing. And I was so nervous I was going to rip her dress or, you know, something <laughs> crazy like that. And so luckily that did not happen. And the bride was so sweet and everything worked out so well. That was one of the biggest rushes of emotions I remember. I'll never forget it. And it was just so nice that I was a little intern from Kentucky and she just kind of let me take the reins on that event. So that was really fun to get to do that. And that's awesome. Yes. So like I was going to ask you, so how exactly did you get into the industry? But like that already answers all that. Yes. That's, what a small <laughs> world. That's so, I mean, it's just so I don't even know if this is a word, but like serendipity-ish. Mm, it <laughs> is. It's like she started with me and then you started with her. And like, y'all, we didn't plan this. Like, I'm not. Right. It's like a trickling down effect, which is great. I love that. <laughs> so like, what is your, this is probably my favorite question for you because mm -hmm. I love your title about the whole window part. So yeah. like being special and unique about like your service and what you provide and the whole breaking into the industry. Like what is your thought? Like what's your, ex your true experience been? <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was a wonderful time in my life. Being a student, I was very green. My parents were still helping me out financially with a lot. And so that was a very kind of Disney version of the wedding industry for my little eyes and kind of seeing it for the first time. And it was so, you know, kind of what we were talking about before we jumped on, just kind of beautiful. Everything came together so nicely and you weren't down in the floor counting, you know, certain amount of table numbers and things and you weren't trying to lift all these boxes and all these things things at this point. I think that was a really good start to kind of pique my interest. But then I started getting real world experience at that internship as well. And then that led me after college, I did a couple of summers where I worked for Sarah Willard, which she just left Nashville recently and moved on to, I think she's in Colorado now. Um, but I interned under her. Oh, yeah. So I think she... Was it a venue at one point? Yeah, she's the owner of Music City Events. And so, okay, yeah. And I don't know if she still owns the company. I think she may have given the reins to some of the other girls that work there as well. 
but she was awesome to intern under. And that's where I really rolled up my sleeves and I was lifting rentals and furniture. And at one point I had like a 30 pound, huge crystal uh, centerpiece that I was in charge of kind of carrying from one end of a ballroom to the other at the streamer horn. And I was sweating bullets thinking I was going to drop this thing. So right. that's kind of where it started. You know, I started out very kind of smooth sailing and then it ended up kind of taking me to more of the down and dirty side of the industry that you've got to really not be someone that's faint of heart and just be ready to have some true grit and work your hardest at these events. And it was a lot of long hours and late nights, but it was so much fun. And I just remember, you know, all of that that kind of goes away as soon as you see how happy the clients were. And so getting yep. to see like the smile on the bride's face and her saying like, this is what I've been dreaming about since I was a little girl. For me, all of the hard work was so worth it at that point. So I started out, I went and did my uh, few years at Belmont. I was a transfer student. So I came in my sophomore year and I did an entrepreneurship class. And so that was kind of centered around picking out a career that you feel like would encompass what you want to do for a living. And luckily, one of the other girls had introduced me to wedding planning. So I got started there. And then after college, I just remember those experiences. And I started working for a venue in a small town outside of Nashville. And so that's when I really thought, you know, wow, this is my moment to shine. I'm freshly out of college, but I think I can handle this. And that was a very big learning experience in my life. But it was also something that kind of threw me off my path and kind of derailed my plans to be an event planner. I started working for them. And at first, everything was great. I was learning really quickly. I was actually learning enough to be the lead coordinator while the other lead coordinator went on her maternity leave. I was kind of thrown into this job. I was a receptionist. I did, they also had a catering company in this venue. And so I was a server. I would clean the facilities. I would answer phones. I would book all the appointments, pretty much any job that you can think of that a catering staff or someone that owns a venue would be doing. I was helping with everything. And so instead of just being a wedding planner and kind of focusing on those details, it came to be a lot more than I realized I was signing up for. Long story short, that in, that did not work out for me. I actually ended up being let go from the company because they told me that I was not learning quickly enough. What? And ended up <laughs> uh, replacing me with one of their family members. And oh. so I kind of feel like till this day that may have been more for them to be able to create a job for a family member. But it was not a good experience. I remember one of my last days there, the planner and I just did not really have the same outlook on life. She was a very, as you kind of do in your webinar and everything with your personality tests, she was a green and I was a blue. And so oh, we just did God. not mesh well. She was very analytical. She wanted things a certain way. And if I did not do it down to the very you know, meticulous details that she wanted. It just was not what she was happy with. And so I kind of remember my very last day there, I was in the room right next to where the boss and the planner were discussing my role in the company. And they just kept kind of saying, I didn't know they were talking about me at the time. And they just kept saying, she's terrible. She doesn't know what she's doing. Like she's going to ruin everything for us. She can't do this. Oh my gosh. And they, I think they knew I could hear them, which was kind of the worst part of it all. And so here I am thinking I'm doing a good job. And I didn't know at the time that conversation was about me. I thought that was about someone else that worked there. And so I, I left home and kind of came back the next day. And the owner pulled me into her office and she just said, you know, you're just not a good fit. You're not learning quickly enough. I had been there like a month and a half and I was doing my very best, but it was just very overwhelming. And yeah. so at that point, um, I left the events industry and I was just kind of in shock. I didn't really know what my next move was going to be. And I think after hearing them say such negative things, kind of 
repeated on a loop in my head for a while. I was just really in my own head and yep. I told trash. Myself, yeah. Trash <laughs> Get it out. Trash. All the awful, you know, feelings. And so I just said, I'm not good enough for this. If they don't think that I am, I shouldn't Aww. do this. You know, that was kind of my mindset at the time. And so I ended up taking a job at AT and T, which <laughs> I went to Belmont That's and did so public fun. relations and all these things. So I was like, maybe I'll, maybe I'll be able to know people well enough with public relations, and I can sell some phones, and it'll be good. So I was like, this will be a safe place for me to work for a while. And unfortunately, I got cussed at or yelled at every single day mm -hmm. that I worked there because people were very frustrated that their phone had mysteriously stopped working or, you know, they spilled coffee on their phone and it didn't save all their files. Like all of you these actually, crazy. <laughs> it's like the, I don't mean to cut you off, but like the edic, again, the education that Apple, I'm actually working with the Apple business team in Nashville to... I'm like, it should be illegal that people invest so much money in Apple products for their companies and you guys let them walk out of here and let them think that this stuff is all backed up on its own. And like, I'll never forget when I first invested in it all and I changed everything from a PC to Mac and I heard about this time machine thing and I like couldn't find something. So I call Apple support, which by the way, if any of you are ever going to invest in Apple, you've got to pay for the freaking insurance. And so that she's like, well, do you have a, is it hooked up to an external hard drive or do you have time capsule? And I'm like, what the hell's that? And which I kind of knew what a hard drive was. Like I was a tech geek. And so I'm like, wait, what do you mean? I have to hook that up? And she laughed. And I'm like, wait, I, d I don't know what you mean. So then it's, you know, I've learned the hard way. Right. And so anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, no, I totally understand that. I've like actually sold people phones and they walk out of the parking lot. And as soon as they walk out, they drop their brand new iPhone and it's unusable at that point. And their screen is cracked and they did not decide to purchase the insurance on the phone. And so that's the worst feeling. Cause it's like, you know, you just bought this shiny new iPhone and it's not working anymore. And so that would be, you know, something I would have to kind of deal with on my end and they would try to bring it in and return it. And I'm like, you know, once you leave the store, it's kind of like when you buy a car for the first time, once you leave the lot, it's not always worth what it was as soon as you drive off. And so unfortunately right. with a broken phone, there wasn't a lot to do there, but you know, I was just getting to the point where I was very depressed. I was not happy at that job. It just wasn't fulfilling any of the things that I'm passionate about and getting to be creative and all of those sides of my personality that are really important for me to focus on. And so that's kind of when my husband came to me. He was my boyfriend at the time, but we're newlyweds. And so he came to me and just said, you know, this is not what you want to do. I see how unhappy you are every day that you come home from work. Let's see what we can do to kind of start this and make you your own boss and do weddings. And I just told him, you know, if I'm going to do it and I'm going to really try, then my time is now and I have to, you know, find my own path and my own way. And so that's kind of what this whole, you know, podcast today is really centered on is just finding your window a lot of times people will say, you know, if you can't get into the front door, you know, of an industry, try the side door, try any door you can find. And sometimes when all the doors shut in your face, it's important to just build your own window and climb in. And that's kind of what I did it I did with that. And so I really started from the absolute bottom of not knowing anything about events. And then I spent about five years interning for other people. And then I got to the point where I just told myself, you know, if it's not now, then it's never, and I just have to go for it. And so that's kind of where I started. That's awesome, though. <laughs> and like, kudos to you. And like, what a phenomenal husband you have. Because, you know, I will say it a couple things about what, just to echo what you're saying. First off, like every planner, every designer, every venue everybody has their own way right. because again, our industry is so stinking great. And that's the reason I like to create some type of education around systems and processes and business and boundaries. And it does not have to be this 
stressful. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's why, again, I love that you were on my webinar and you like, my whole thing is like, if I could just go to the top of a mountain and scream out about the psychology behind communicating with people. And I don't know if you knew about true colors at the time that you were like overhearing this conversation and this person was green and you were blue Mm -hmm. and which opposites attract usually for like marriages like that. But typically in job roles, people don't get along because they, they see life so differently and that's not a bad thing, but the fact, and clearly they don't know anything about true colors because they would never talk about someone like that. And so, you know, that's why we, we, it's not just a recommendation. It's like, you have to intern with us in order to even have the opportunity in the future to work with us because we do things very differently. And so trying to figure out how your brain is naturally wired and put you in a position to set you up for success, not failure. Let's not focus on your weaknesses or your palest color. Let's 85% of the time try to really pull you out of what you don't want to do. And it helps people learn about themselves and other people. And it's just, a, it creates such a negative environment, which you said it, it's just depressing. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know if you remember this, but a couple years ago, a planner, a big planner in Nashville, she's been doing it as long as I had, she like took her own life in Percy Warner Park oh, wow. because she was so stressed out. She said her clients were so high maintenance. Mm-hmm. She didn't keep up with her taxes. She, and it was like, she, I guess also suffered from depression, which is a disease. Okay. Yeah. In itself, I can say that because I worked in a mental health hospital. And then some of us who we experience windows, which I love your title, <laughs> we experience windows of depression based on tragedy and based on things that happen to us in our life. But those of us who don't suffer from depression as a true mental illness documented you know, psychologically and documented in your chart, you know, at your doctor's office. Um, It's just, it's, we come out of it, you know, but we've all probably, my very first experience with real depression is when my computer got a virus in college. And a week later, my car was broken into, my planner was stolen, which I mean that again, that's like reason one, two, and then our town flooded in 2010. So Mm. it's like paperless backing up technology, super important to me for multiple reasons. But I literally was so sad and upset and depressed and I never wanted to feel that way again. So that's why I'm like super anal and passionate about Mm helping people understand that because until you can feel what somebody feels, you, you don't know, and you don't know how to help. Um, so I'm just so happy to hear you say that no matter what they were saying and your husband was able to like pull that out of you, because even as females one and like self-confidence and self-esteem and these little things where people Even they shouldn't even be doing that in the first place. Like if that were in my environment, I would be like, get the F out. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's the mindset of let's figure out what your strengths are. And obviously you had interned with people who know what they're doing Mm -hmm. and being blue. For those of you who are listening, who don't know what true colors are, if you listen to any of my (laughs) podcasts, you probably know it like the back of your hand now, but blue people are amazing. Like on the wedding days, like like you said, taking care of the the person and like carrying the dress and being almost kind of like a personal attendant to where you make sure they're happy. And when they say thank you and hug you at the end of the night, you forget how bad your feet hurt and you forget that you haven't peed or eaten in 25 hours. Mm-hmm. And, but every once in a while, there are people who don't appreciate anything and they're insatiable and we try to not work with those people. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's just expectation. So, how knowing that you're blue Mm -hmm. and knowing that blue people take care of people, they're people pleasers that brings you happiness. Um, from a business perspective, how, how do you position yourself from a business perspective to make sure that sometimes you're not being too blue, you know, on the business side? 
Yes. Does that make sense? No, I think that makes total sense. A lot of times, you know, my business personality is more of a, I guess you could say an orange than a blue. It's funny how you do, wear different hats and you kind of shift. It's very chameleon-like, if you will, um, with the way you sometimes just have to be in certain situations. And, you know, for me to say, I've heard all these negative things and, you know, I'm just going to, I don't care what anybody has to say at this point. Like I've already lost everything. What else do I have to lose? You know, and sometimes you just have to get to that point within yourself. And I'll touch on kind of what you mentioned about depression and anxiety. Like that was something I did not know I had until I started going to therapy. And so that's kind of a recent discovery for me, but just even being aware that you have depression and anxiety and not trying to just overplay your emotions or downplay things that are important. That's the first step for me was just kind of realizing that and just kind of realizing that whatever you want to do, my parents always instilled this for me as, you know, an early child or even now in my adult life. My mom is a cardiologist and she's just an all around, you know, I call her a boss because she has just kind of started. She grew up on a farm in Kentucky and then she's become this very well-known cardiologist in our community. And she was one of the first women to break into that industry and do that. And so growing up under her and kind of seeing her do that and then having a father who is a teacher and who's, I would say he's a very blue personality as well. He always loves to give to others, but a lot of times blue personalities, we don't take enough time for ourselves, And so I think that's the first step in being able to manage a business effectively is making sure that you're also managing self-care for yourself, taking time out and setting appropriate boundaries with clients and just saying, you know, I cannot text you at 1130 at night, but if you just want to email me, I'll be available between such and such hour. It's just so important, unless there's a bridal emergency, which I try to be, you know, available 24 seven. But if there's not an emergency, you do have to set those healthy boundaries. And I think even listening to your webinar and hearing you reiterate that and then just surrounding yourself with people who have like-minded values in your industry. Uh, the great thing about being a planner is that if you have a really negative experience with a vendor or with a venue or someone that you just know, this isn't a good fit. You know, it may not be appropriate for me to work with them in this situation then it's also good because you kind of get the power to decide, you know, and I try to give everyone the benefit of the doubt and second chances. But if you just know it's not going to be a good, healthy fit for you from the beginning, especially with clients that you're working with, that's also very crucial. So I think just being aware of those personality traits is kind of the first step kind of entering into any business situation. Absolutely. And it's funny because on one of my webinars, it's, I know a lot of information, but step one of anything that I like to teach all starts with the foundation of psychology. Mm -hmm. And I get so many emails and like DMs and all these, you know, social media messages. And they're like, can I just get module two with like the photo and the video stuff? Like, I just want to know how to do that. And I'm like, Yes, but you're not doing yourself justice and you're not going to save yourself money because you're not going to understand how to implement it because you don't know anything about the psychology methodology. Mm -hmm. So there is an order and there is a method to the madness. I mean, to me, it's like a bride coming in or a couple coming in and saying like, we want to do um, this, 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 and this. And I'm like, well, we have to do A, B, C, D to get to X, Y, Z. So you don't ask your guests for RSVPs 12 months in advance. Like you can typically send, say the dates out. However, if we're really going to do this right, there's a few logistical things that need to happen. A, your hotel blocks need to be in place. B, we need to have a responsive website up for them so that they, we, we can drive and potty train people in the very beginning. And so there's a lot of psychology that you can do on the front end and so what I've learned, and it's so amazing because you're such a young business owner and it is the most refreshing thing ever to hear you understand boundaries, 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 run your business. Don't let it run you. Don't let your clients run you because it took me 10 years at least 
to get there. Mm -hmm. And, and it was kind of the hard way, but also too, like when I started social media, it didn't exist. Podcast didn't exist. YouTube didn't exist. Like none of these resources where people actually want to share authentic, real information that didn't really exist. And so it's like, I feel like we were just kind of, you know, figuring it out. <laughs> and, but I will say like surrounding myself now with people who are green and different colors that I am not. And A, I don't want to do that. And B, I'm not good at it. So finding out what you're good at and what makes you happiest and then really surrounding yourself with people who are not like you will help you get successful. And so, and I will also say like, now I'm kind of to the point, again, I've been doing a long time, but where people are like, do we have to use your vendors? And I'm like, do you even know what you're saying? Like, they're not my vendors. They own their own companies. They can work with anybody. Mm -hmm. However, I'm going to choose to work with specific vendors because, and then it's like an education course, right? right? It's like, they have to have business license. They have to have an insurance, insurance policy, and they have to know the goal of what we're trying to do here. And they need to understand my method to the madness with all the floor plans we do and the timelines. And it's a potty training process, like in the sweetest way possible. And, you know, people come on to a scene and then they come off to a scene and then people get burnt out and then people get comfortable and then they get lazy, you know, which I've seen happen over the years. Like if I look at when I first started working with vendors and then like where I'm at now, I mean, you're going to go through different people and find your tribe, you know? Right. So I couldn't agree with you more. It's so refreshing, mm -hmm. so refreshing that you understand that you, it's funny. One of my coaches, he's like, he came and observed like what I said. And he's like, so why do you tell people like you call me or text me anything you need 365 days a year, 24 seven. He's like, that's worse than an on-call doctor. And I love that your mom's a cardiologist mm -hmm. because here's another analogy that I use a ton, which is in healthcare. But it's like, you know, you've got general surgeons, you've got, um, you know, they can take out gallbladders, you've got colorectal surgeons who've done fellowships. So if you have colon cancer, you have an orthopedist, you have general orthopedist, and then you have fellowship trained orthopedists. So it's like, you've got your hand specialist and your hip specialist and your foot specialist. And like, if you were in a heart attack situation, and you're dying, would you rather see a general surgeon or you want to see a cardiologist? And if you have a blockage, would you want to see a certain type of cardiologist? You know what I mean? Like a thoracic cardiologist. And so I don't want to get, again, healthcare geeky on people, but it's the same thing with weddings. It's like the most important thing usually in that person's life. And are you going to someone that's just generalizing everything for you? Or, and with Pinterest, everybody wants their own special brand, which right. I do love. Um, or do you want somebody who actually understands the branding, who's interned, who has hands-on experience? Because I'm just going to tell you, and you probably hear me say it a hundred times in a month, you cannot read a book or watch videos or learn this shit online. You can't. You can help yourself, but until you're in that real situation, it's like, how are you going to react? How are you going to put out the fires? Like literally put out the fires. So. Yeah. It's so funny that you mentioned, um, healthcare and kind of my mom, because I was at a wedding actually last weekend. It's so crazy, but there was a man there and he was actually a grandfather to the bride and he started having a heart attack. Oh and my God. I had never worked this venue before. I'm an events um, intern kind of on my spare time and I like to still stay relevant. So I do events assisting as well as running my own company. And so this was kind of my chance to prove myself at this venue. I was getting started and this man just comes up to me and he has this white expression on his face. It's like his face is as pale as a ghost and I can just tell, you know, something is wrong with him. And he just tells me, he's like, my dad, I think is having a heart attack. And I go, okay. And I didn't know his dad was even there. I thought he just meant, you know, he talked on the phone with his dad. He's having a heart attack. I said, I'm so sorry about that. I said, where is he? And he said, well, he's in the parking lot. 
And I was like, he's in the parking lot at this venue. And so I was just an event staff. I wasn't even the planner at this wedding. And I came up to the planner and I just said, oh my gosh, this man is having a heart attack. And I could tell, you know, we were both kind of in shock. And then I just said, my mom's a cardiologist. So I just called my mom and I told my mom, you know, she answered the phone like a mom and she's like, oh, hey, honey, you know, how's it going? And then I had my very stern, serious voice. And I just said, he's having a heart attack. And she went straight into doctor mode and was able to help us get him to the ER and time but it's just like the connections you make sometimes are people you know from your family or you know people in this industry you kind of just have to be prepared for anything and just be prepared to land on your feet and then at the most important thing I think in crisis situations I always try to put myself in the shoes of people that are dealing with this and Mm -hmm. how would I want to be treated if I was having a heart attack or what would I need to get better or to you know heal from this if this is happening and so you know, that carries me a lot of times when I'm working weddings, but as a business owner, I try to put myself in my intern shoes or my assistant shoes. And I just say to myself, you know, if I was them, which I was a few years ago, yeah. what would I want to hear from my boss? How would I improve on what I'm doing? And something that my husband always reiterates to me, and he's great at doing this, is he always says, work hard and be nice to people. And yes, I think the experience that I had at this other venue, even though it was the opposite of that, um, I think it was such a learning experience for me. And it's one of those things I always tell my friends, like if they hear that I'm a wedding planner now or, you know, I'm doing events, they always say, oh, my gosh, are you just like Jennifer Lopez in the movie oh. The Wedding Planner? And I'm like, do you not want to puke? No, I'm not like her. I don't have a little <laughs> headset. And I don't point to where centerpieces will go. And hopefully I'm not having, you know, crazy relationships with the groom of the groom. <laughs> So, you know, I try to like really separate myself and I say, that's a fun movie to watch, but like people don't realize how down and difficult and just, it's a lot of hard work that weddings can be. And I think we touched on, this is not a glamorous industry. There are glamorous pieces to everything, but this is not for the faint of heart. And so that's kind of one of my big takeaways is that yes, this industry is not for the faint of heart, but people that are tuned into this podcast and are working on bettering themselves and building information and knowledge, this is, you know, proving to you that you're already taking the steps necessary to get the information. So you're not for the faint of art either. You have true grid. And I just want to inspire everybody. You know, if this is your passion, then the sky is the limit and you just have to grow or you're planted and see what kind of opportunities you have around you to just really make this the career that you're dreaming of. It's nobody else's career. They can't build it for you. You have to take those steps, but, you know, just use what you have available to you and try to grow from that. Yeah. You are so impressive. Like you're so (laughs) well-spoken. Oh, thank you. This is my first podcast. So I'm happy that I haven't messed it up too bad so far. (laughs) You Well, and like you have a great voice and I mean, again, for being so young and, but again, it's like, I try to remind people age is just a number Mm -hmm. and sometimes it can come into play. Yes. And I feel like in one of these situations, like, you know, I teach a lot in the, in some people that come into my classes, my tech classes, they're over 50 and they know that they need to learn how to stay relevant or know a little bit in order to like stay in business. But then it's like, they forget all this other stuff or it's like, no one ever told them. And I'm like, let's back up here mm-hmm. <laughs> and talk about the psychology of it and how you need to hear it and how we can implement it. And there's not many... I know a lot of people my age probably talk about millennials like really negatively. And, yes. and, and I will say that, and you're probably like so sick of hearing it. Um, but again, going back to psychology, I don't care what generation you're part of, your brain is still going to be wired one of those ways. Right. And so the millennials is people, they're like, oh my God, they're so entitled and they're so this and I'm so that. Well, I'm like, well, I actually reframe and I look at it a little bit of a different way because the parents are younger, they're growing up with technology. Like we didn't have all these things. Um, Like the fact that my 10 year old niece asked for an iPhone for her birthday, like that's just inappropriate. (laughs) Right. I'm like, and she's like, but all my other friends, I'm like, first off, 
I don't care what your other friends have. And we're going to focus on what's important for you and how you're going to grow up. And the fact that you think it's okay at 10 to have these distractions is not going to happen around me. Like you're a gymnast. You're going to focus on that. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that when I was 10. And I'm like, oh my God, I sound like a grandma. (laughs) Hey, I didn't have it when I was 10 either. And I'm a millennial. So hey. Exactly. I think parenting styles are so unique and different. Yes. Yes. I will say I was totally, I'm still, you know, if I try to get a job right now, a lot of times, and this is something that helped me back, you know, with the other experiences that I have were negative was that I am a millennial. Um, I hear a lot of, like you said, negative talk about that. And a lot of times it's that we're lazy. We don't want to work. And it's crazy to me because the millennials that I know that are a lot of times my peers and my friends or students that were in classes with me, we're some of the most hardworking people you'll meet. A lot of times we do internships and all the grunt work for free. And so luckily, you know, we have kind of a support system within our self. And I think any generation has labels that they're probably not super thrilled to have. A lot of times the older generation, you know, will be labeled as like what you were saying, like they don't have a lot of information on technology. But to be honest, it's funny because I feel like it's kind of a person by person basis. And I am not the most tech savvy. I think between you and I, you're way more tech savvy than I am. And so... (laughs) It's funny to kind of look at the parallels there and see how different that is. But I think you're so right that you have to kind of find out what are the fundamental truths of just being a human being and being in this industry and what are things that we can all connect on. And a lot of times, like I will say, the wedding industry can be very competitive Um, There's a million and one wedding planners in Nashville alone, which is awesome. And I'm all for that. But I think it's hard to sometimes see the work that other people are doing and feel like you're worthy or that you're capable of, you know, doing a good job with things. And there's so many people that have 20 plus years of experience on me and I'm brand new to this. And so I think just kind of seeing that and then just meeting yourself where you are and just telling yourself like, okay, Angela can design one of the most beautiful event spaces that I've ever seen, but I'm also, this is my first year of business, you know? So I think just trying to be kind to yourself, realistic with yourself, but also, you know, being very firm and standing up for yourself when you need to. So kind of walking that fine line is very important. Very. Like one girl um, I was listening to uh, from this entrepreneur group and she said, Um, there were a lot of age gaps in there and somebody stood up and said like, you know, how do you know this? And how do you know that? And da, 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 you're getting older. And, um, which I very much feel the same where like, I love my age. I love that I have experience, Mm -hmm. um, like true experience to share. I'm not making this stuff up. And, but the girl said, listen, she's like, don't let your beginning or she, how'd she say it? She said, my middle to end is not your middle to end. Like you're beginning a new journey. And the fact that like you're here and you're at a conference and you're investing in yourself is the first step because back when we started again, like a lot of this stuff didn't exist. So there's a lot more resources and you are right. Like a lot of the millennials, most of them in in turn with us, they're millennials. Um, and it's all in, some of it really is how they're brought up, like in how they're raised and they're, they don't know what they don't know. They're not educated. They don't know any other way than to ask for it. Like one girl, if she said one more time to me, um, how would she say it? Well, I don't want to overcommit. I think, and I'm like, finally, I was like, listen, I respect that. But do you even realize what you're saying? Like when you're in the planning industry, you overcommit the hell out of yourself. But you know what? People are going to pay for your value. So price is what you pay and value is what you get. Mm -hmm. So I really had to work hard to like reframe what she kept saying because I'm like, okay, we need to do da 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 So, I mean, as you know, there's some weeks where we might work in our pajamas from home. Mm -hmm. And then there's other weeks where I literally have meetings from 7am in the morning till one o'clock in the morning. 
And when people are interning, I'm like, you can come to whatever you want. The more you're around, the more you're going to learn. And I think now because I do so many podcasts and videos, people are afraid to say like, when am I going to eat or I have to pee? My feet hurt. I'm like, you're an adult. So like you go do what you need to do, but like, don't tell me your feet hurt. Don't tell me your back hurts. Like mine hurts too. Mm -hmm. But again, doing it for the right reasons, there, there is a worth, there is a payoff. Um, Yeah. So I think just finding, just like you said, like just finding yourself and what's going to make you happy Mm -hmm. is so, so important. Like, what do you think right now are the biggest challenges like in our industry? I would say we're kind of in an industry where everything is expected to be perfect, Mm -hmm. which, you know, a bride, this is her biggest day of her life. And this is something that couples look for you know, from the moment they're, you know, old enough to know what a wedding is, they're dreaming about what kind of dress am I going to wear? What colors am I going to have at my wedding? I was the same exact way. I was just recently a bride last October. And so I know that very well, but I think just trying to reframe the client's mind, you can look at Pinterest all day long and say, oh my gosh, this draping is gorgeous, but my budget is this price. And this draping is 10 times what my overall wedding budget is, you know, or things like that. And just trying to, I always tell my clients, you know, this is one of those industries where we're expected to be perfect. And I want to make your day as close to perfect as possible. But what can we do? What are the three things that are so important to you? Whether that that be floral, your dress, the catering, the music, what are the three elements of your wedding that you're not willing to settle on? And then what are some areas that we can kind of supplement in? It may not be exactly what you had in mind, but we want to make sure we're staying on your budget or close to that and kind of what you're willing to spend and work within. So I think a lot of times, and you know, I hate Pinterest, but I love Pinterest at the same time because a lot of these things that they're bringing to me are style shoots. Some of these things are even real cakes. They're dummy cakes and they're not even oh made with God. edible materials. You know, it's just crazy <laughs> the things that they're able to do now with modern technology and Photoshop and all that cool stuff. But it also makes our job to reproduce something like this 10 times harder. And so I think just having to re-educate the client and just say, this is what your budget is, but let's see if we can find some other creative solutions. Um, Another thing I think is kind of right now I am newer in my business. So even as a bride, if I looked, you know, when I was planning my wedding and I said, okay, I like this photographer's photos, but she's only has one year of experience or I love this photographer's photos. She's a little high, pricier than what I'm willing to pay, but you know, she also has 20 years of experience. So I think it's hard for me a little bit right now because I am so new in my business. Um, but as I'm working to develop more content and get kind of more authentic images out to the public and getting those really great reviews that I know are really awesome to boost your business, those are all things that I'm kind of building right now. Um, and I think just kind of you know, educating yourself on what is expected of you and what's not expected of you. And so it's really easy, like you were saying, to overwork yourself and to get involved in situations that may not be the wedding planner's job, you know. And I think it's great because in our industry, we can wear so many different hats. We can be a therapist and a stylist and a designer and all these things in one. But if we're not really honing in on what it is we're supposed to be doing as the planner, then we can also get lost in kind of a storm of all these different things that, you know, are kind of fall more on other vendors or other jobs. And so I like to try to, you know, be the ringleader of the wedding, but I also don't want to overwork myself or put myself in a place where I am not focused on, you know, what I need to actually be really committed to doing. Uh, You couldn't have said it any better. Like, that's another thing. My younger self mentality was like, oh, I'll just do it myself. (laughs) They just don't know how to do it. But like, you cannot, hey, don't do that. Mm -hmm. 
be a really good communicator and communicate. And sometimes figuring out people's color based on their psychology is going to be the first step. And then figuring out the best way to say it to where you and that person understands. And it is frustrating sometimes, but you've got to respect one another. And so I, I started to see that like as I grow and then the more coaching and the more investment I did on myself and education, I really, really opened the dialogue to all my vendors. I'm like, listen, if there's something I'm doing that drives you crazy, please tell me, mm -hmm. like, let's discuss it. I am here, like you said, to be mom, to be, be ringleader. Mm -hmm. um, but, and do, do we know how to do half that stuff? Yeah. Do we want to? No. Is it a good idea? Absolutely not. Can you be everything to everybody? Absolutely not. Pick what you're happiest, what you can monetize and make a living off of while you do what you love. It is crazy how many people they're like, wait, so do you do invitations and do you rent tuxedos and do you not have your own linens and do you not? And I'm like, I'm a, I have never had that. Right. Like planning in itself is so much. Then you've got the design portion. Then you've got all the vendors that go with that. I mean, it's just so much mm -hmm. that people don't understand. Yes. So I feel like, you know, we are getting better at education. You're proving it right now because <laughs> you. you're, an, you know, you're a young new business owner, which I love that you are educating yourself. Like kudos to you. Just, I just feel like um, more people like you need to educate themselves. And then because you're, you're recently married, newlywed. So as you were educating yourself, like you kind of knew some stuff when you were getting married. And I know earlier you said that you knew you were going to be your worst client. Yes. <laughs> but you know, going through I knew it, I would be my most demanding <laughs> client for sure. Because <laughs> your expectations. But you know yeah. what? Like, I also want to remind people as we wrap up, like, you got sometimes as a planner and design, and we're so into Pinterest and we're so into perfection. And we're so into everything being so right. Don't put all that pressure on yourself because at the end of the day, there is one freaking goal. Mm -hmm. And that goal is not, yes, we want the clients and the guests to have an amazing, perfect experience and then be happy. That's not even the, okay, let's back up. The foundation of why we're even celebrating is because you're marrying your best friend. Mm -hmm. And that's what I have to step back and often remind people like this is not about spending $50,000 on flowers and $20,000. You know, it's like, let's start off with the foundation. What's important to you? And then let's build something custom for you, whether it be that the flowers are more important. Or, I don't know. Just sometimes I'm like, my God, I feel like you guys are just like going through the motions. And it's mm -hmm. not fun to work with people who do that. Like you really want to work. I do. I want to work with people who are in love and I feel like it's going to last and we're not just going through the motions, spending a bunch of money, you know? Yes. That's so important to me. And I'll tie this back in. Like I'm sure you've seen the sex in the city movie. I think it's the second movie or maybe the first one where I think it's the first one she's supposed to get married and she lets yeah. the wedding The one of the biggest quotes of the whole film, it's so over dramatic, but you let the wedding get bigger than you. And that's kind of like what her fiance big says to her after all these years, it's not about me anymore. It's about your wedding. And that was something I had to, I loved my husband. We dated for five years before we got married and knowing him in and out, like I made the clear decision that I wanted to marry him, not to throw a fancy party, not to invite all my friends to dance on the dance floor with me, but to really commit to him. And that's something that I always tell my bride and grooms or, you know, any couples I work with, I work with, you know, people of all walks of life. And I want them to know that love is the foundation, like you were saying. Um, and I try to always find ways, even if we have beautiful floral or, you know, crazy lighting or things like that, I try to always focus it back in and say, you know, one of the first meetings that I take with the bride is I ask her about her home life with her partner or, you know, I ask them about what was it that made you fall in love with your partner and what is it that you guys would do, you know, if it's a Sunday afternoon and you're hanging out, what are your favorite date nights? What do you like to eat? Like, what are some meals that you're used to preparing? And I try to really include that into like the catering or the design or anything like that to give it 
I want people to walk into their space. And if they've never, you know, been to a wedding like this, I want them to kind of come away with the feeling that, oh my gosh, like this is, this is couple's wedding and I'm here and I can see how every little detail is so them. And yep. one of my um, favorite memories recently of this season was one of the guests at the wedding. She walked in and she's like, oh my gosh, this is so them. And she was laughing because um, I helped design like an arcade themed wedding. And <laughs> there, it was so much fun. The couple were like really big into gaming and arcade and they just love like vintage old school, like Mario games and stuff like that too. And they just all walked in and that was kind of the light theme throughout the night. And everybody that walked into the space, they were just kind of, you know, laughing and so excited that they had included this in their reception because it was so them. And that's something I really like to work with. When I work with couples, I try to always ask them like, what are themes and what are things that are really, you know, individually you and that other person? And so that's always fun to get to work and get so intimate with other people and kind of realize like what is so unique about their love story. Yeah. And I'll say like, I know I just, I could talk to you all day, (laughs) but like, I feel like some planners, they get so uh, caught up in things being easy Mm -hmm. and comfortable where that's not good enough anymore. So if you go back and start like with the roots, why are we here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and really figure out like how can we customize all this? They're happy, you're happy, you know it reflects them, they know it reflects them, and it it really does make for a happy ending, as cheesy as it may sound. Mm-hmm. Um, but tell our listeners where they can find you and find you on social media and all that good stuff. Yes. And so I am on Instagram. I have uh, my own Instagram. It's Memory Lane Events LLC. So I manage that. And I also have a blog on my website. So if you go to my website, it's memorylane.events. And I have a tab there that's for my blog. It's RSVP. So it's all about events and it's great ways to save money and just inspiration for design and other fun elements to wedding planning. And then I've also got a Facebook page that is Memory Lane Events. And it's just, um, you click in that, you'll see my little website there and you'll be able to kind of review some photos. And I'm also on the knot as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Erin. Yes, thank I you for having me. It. it was so much fun. Love chatting with you. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. Bye. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with your friends. And I'm so very grateful if you will leave a review. Be sure you are a subscriber so you never, ever miss the juicy details of Weddings Unveiled. Also, be sure that you're a part of my email list. And if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.